Hello. Hello. Hello, 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 hello. I think I'm on. Sounds like I'm on. Feels like I'm on. I got little bouncies. I have sound. I am on. Hey everybody, it's Mike Myers here for his Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 2 o'clock Central Daylight Time Ask Me Anything live stream. The goal of this live stream is to provide those of us who are isolated because of the coronavirus an opportunity to continue our work on the CompTIA exams, in particular IT Fundamentals, A+, Net+, and Security+, although we can certainly go beyond that as needed. Uh, this live stream goes from 2 o'clock my time till 4 o'clock or until we run out of answer questions. Sorry, I've always got an answer. Uh, until we run out of questions. So it can sometimes end earlier. Uh, it's only happened a couple of times, but you never know. Uh, so the idea here is you have to ask me questions, okay? Now there's two ways to ask questions. Number one, hey Dr. Quinn. Number one, you can just uh, type messages into the live chat and we can just respond there. Uh, we got lots of folks on here to uh, help you as well as me. Um, Scott Jernigan uh, is always around. Sometimes Dave Rush, sometimes Michael Smyre, uh, as well as a cast of thousands. Um, we've got a small crowd today. It's only 20 people, eh, whatever. Um, it, it will grow. Um, the uh, topics today are, oh, also if you want to, you can just uh, send me an email. Uh, so you can just send an email to either one of those email addresses. Uh, I'm Senor Pepe on Steam if you ever feel like gaming, although right now I'm kind of on a Rise of Nations kick, which is not a Steam game. Uh, that is my office number. Uh, it is answered. There's no one at our office as we're Total Seminars is completely remote at this point in the game. Uh, but if you absolutely positively have to call me, uh, you can do it that way. And when in doubt, just look up the name Desweds and I show up at a thousand different places there. Now, just because you guys are kind enough to show up today, uh, we have a special offer. Uh, we always have a special offer. Uh, but today's special offer is, I forgot. I know it's 60% off of our tests, but it's 60% of something else. I forgot. Oh, it'll come back to me in a minute. So anyway, uh, Scott Jernigan will post that up for me uh, on the chat. So you just go to www.totalsem.com and uh, order the, uh, let me look it up. I don't want to lie to you. Oh, thank you, Scott. 60% off Total Seminars, our simulations and the practice. So all any of our uh, simulations, which are performance-based questions, as well as practice tests, 60% off, which is ridiculously low price. Code MM Live Fireworks. Um, so uh, MM Live Fireworks at checkout, and you get 60% off. Ridiculously low prices. Um, on, on top of that, if you contact uh, Kathy Y at totalsim.com, I'm just reading off the stream because I forget all these things. Uh, they have we have special on bundles. So I know a lot of you guys come from like Linda, LinkedIn, Udemy, next to you, places like that. But if you want the videos through Total Seminars, and especially for schools and such, that can often be a good deal. Uh, Kathy Y at totalsim.com. Just send her an email and she'll be glad to talk to you about those. So uh, for some reason, I got like no emails over the last couple of days, at least I'm getting a lot of emails on, you know, helping uh, people's school reports, you know, and when I do have time, I'm glad to do that too, honest to Pete, but uh, sometimes that can be a little bit tough. Um, getting a lot of people who are asking about career help. Uh, we are going to be covering some of that. Uh, Andrew Hutz, you're uh, finally going to get your resume and we're putting you front and center on there. Don't worry, I took out your phone number and your home address. But we're going to be talking about resumes. Uh, and the other thing we had a question on is somebody wanted to go into AAA, in particular Radius and TACA, TACAX, and, uh, which we're going to do those for sure today, uh, plus whatever else happens to pop up. I can see there's a few things coming in. There's, look at that, Network Mage, first one to post today. And Tolowit, Alan Duggan, Matt. Dr. Quinn, 
Hi, Mike. And, and nice to see you. Okay, I am terrible at acronyms. Uh, Dave L. Al Mulford. Hey, Al. Hey, Wissa, throw me my hat. Look to your right. Wissa. Uh, she's got a headset on, too. We're all working remotely these days. Uh, sorry, I was going to have Wissa grab the hat for you. Uh, wait from 2003. I, I don't know what that means. Uh, Dave L. Hi, everyone. What are the following steps if you see in your home router that in the ARP table the default gateway has a different MAC address for sure? I got to think about that one for a minute. The ARP table in your home router. Uh, okay, I'll, I don't know what home router would show an ARP table, but we'll just assume you have one that does. <coughs> The default gateway has a different MAC address for sure. So you're saying the default gateway in your home router, am I reading this right? And has a different MAC address. I mean, I've seen on a lot of these home routers where you can, uh, they, they'll let you spoof the MAC address on the router. Uh, that's mainly done to get around uh, DOSIS or cable modems. You still, it used to be terrible. It's not as quite as bad of a problem today. So you're, uh, here in the United States, if you use the cable modem from your cable company, you usually end up paying like five bucks a month, and that's just craziness. So what a lot of people do is they'll go out and buy their own cable modem, 40, 50 bucks, and they stop paying $5 a month. The problem is, is that when you do that, the cable company recognizes the MAC address would be different on the DOSA side where you're screwing in the F-type connector and they'll either shut you down or force a reset or some other things like that. And uh, you can spoof your old routers, the, the one that the ISP gave you, spoof that MAC address and uh, you don't have to go through all the reset and everything. Uh, to be honest with you, like here in, here in the U.S., most of that, those folks are pretty good about it now. They know you can do that. And they'll, you plug in a new home router, I don't spoof the MAC addresses anymore, mm -hmm. simply because uh, I just call the cable company, they do a bleep, blah, bloop, and uh, it's up and cooking uh, very, very quick. So, uh, I, so Dave L, when you say it's a different MAC address, from what? So what, what should it have been? So, Maybe you were spoofing. Uh, I'd have you, Dave develop this. I'll keep watching. Uh, give me, give me a little more information there, brother. Uh, uh, um. Network mage. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm always shivery when you ask me questions. Is it normal for ping commands to not work in an IPv6 network? Um, okay, so you forget about the IPv6 here, Network Mage. You're just trying to ping. Uh, let me uh, I'm gonna try something real quick. I have not done this in ages. I'm just firing up a quick... Here, I'll let you guys watch all the fun I'm having here. All right, so I'm just... Bing, uh. All right, so I was, I got a successful ping. Uh. All right, and this one, this one doesn't work. <laughs> okay, I, I got enough to guess at least. Uh, sunspots? No, I'm kidding. Uh, probably what's happening here more than else is that somebody's blocking ICMP requests on the server side. I'm pretty sure that's all it is. Uh, also keep in mind that uh, just because you typed in Google and I typed in Google and I was successful and you weren't, you have to remember that there are hundreds of thousands of Google servers, and there have there are documented variances between them. 
So the fact that you get one result, Network Mage, and I get a different one doesn't bother me on something like that. So is it normal? Uh, it is very normal to not be able to ping servers. I was actually surprised when I pinged Google and it worked, to be honest with you. I, the, what I saw on the uh, Jesus Christ phone, I'm not asking for you. I said the G word and my phone lit up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, in my experience, it's usually not successful to ping based on fully qualified domain names. In fact, it's often not successful to ping on raw IP addresses, IPv4 or IPv6. Um, Brian Jenkins, you're welcome. Ciao, Mr. Portugal himself. How are you? I'm good. Red TB3, hello all. Hello, Red TB3. Uh, ba -da -ba -ba. Yep. I'm studying away for the 1002. Good luck, man. Knock it, knock it out of the park. DNS, you're asking, okay, DNS. Oh, sorry, Scott. I said a naughty word. Uh, what do you want to talk about DNS? What do you want to know about DNS? Uh, oh, is that in reference to uh, what me and Network Mage were talking about a moment ago? Not sure. Okay. Your web servers are blocking and I have them configured to respond. Uh, then I would say you don't have them configured to respond. Uh, there would have, you'd have to be looking around. And it's usually not on the server itself. Uh, I guess you could if you actually had a host-based firewall. It's a firewall. You just got a firewall. You got to turn off the firewall wherever it's doing it. Also, keep in mind that most uh, stateful firewalls often block ICMP in and of themselves. So I wouldn't be looking on your server so much, although I guess it wouldn't hurt to look there. I'd be looking at the, your router between your server and the internet. Rafi and Howie and Israel. Okay, I'll see you in a minute. Can ISPs block apps running on IPTV? An ISP can block anything they want anywhere. Uh, Yes. Nineteen ninety-five Texas Aggie. How does one learn about bin files, binary files? Here, ask me a question. Do you do you want to know what a bin? It's a. What is a binary file? Uh, I, I mean, I can ask you those questions. I can answer those. But. So 1995 Texas Aggie, ask me a question and I'll answer it for you. I mean, that's what I'm here for. I mean, the whole function here is to ask questions. I prefer more detailed questions because it's easier for me to answer, uh, but I, I, I'm here to help. So ask anything you want. Okay, I just saw in the home router that in my NAT info, there's an unknown device, which has the same MAC address as that default gateway, which is not the same as my router saw in the home router that in my NAT info, okay, there is an unknown device which has the same MAC address as the, of my default gateway. So given that most of these NAT listings are based on MAC addresses, man, Dave, I wish you could take a picture of that. In fact, that's what you're going to need to do. Dave, take a picture of it or do a screen snap or something and we can take a look at it. You know, keep in mind, just because we don't, I may not get an answer completed today. That's why we do this three days a week, guys. So it, it's very common for sometimes a question to, you know, develop over a few of these meetings. So, you know, don't panic if I can't get to it today or if we only get halfway there. That's okay. Just keep asking. Okay. Oh, and by the way, hey, uh, send me that uh, here. Here's my email address one more time. Send me a screen snap of that, Dave. I want to see it. And uh, I'm pretty sure what I was talking about on the spoofed uh, MAC addresses would still come into play, but you shouldn't have two devices with the same MAC address, that's for sure. So we're going to have to figure that one out. 
Okay, now you're asking me a good question, 1995 Texas Aggie. I see bin files and hear people manipulating them, but I don't know exactly what they do. Okay, well, a bin file is the overwhelm, like if you opened up Windows and saw a bunch of files in your network, in your folder, not even network folder, on your hard drive, the vast majority of those files are bins or binary files. So, uh, are, I'm looking something up. My problem is I know too much. Okay. So uh, I, I had to look up, I know what a binary file is, but you actually asked what a bi bin file extension was. So there's zillions of binary files out there. Probably the Unix executable file type is the one you're talking about. But let's make sure we understand what a bin file is in general. Bin file is a binary file. It's ones and zeros, okay? Uh, you can also make files that are text files using the ASCII uh, 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 character set or the, uh, what's the new 64-bit one? The one that's built into Windows, I forget the name of it. Uh, a binary file is designed to be executable. And that means those ones and zeros are the machine language code that's needed to go into the CPU to make Microsoft Word run or make Star Commander go or, you know, whatever you're doing. Make your web browser come up so you can look at web pages. So it's, it's, it's the actual machine code. And uh, so when you write a program, traditionally, you write a code in like C++ or something like that, and you're using, you know, sort of Englishy looking things, do loops and if thens and all that. And then when the code is done, you compile the code. And what you're doing is you're taking that actual code, which is in kind of a humanish form, the programming language form, and it the compiler turns it into the machine language so that your CPU can actually run it. Uh, if people are editing a binary file, uh, that can be tricky sometimes because it's, it's actually done in uh, computer espionage a lot where someone will take an actual binary file and then reverse engineer it. And there are reverse engineering tools out there, but it, the, it can't bring it back to the original programming language, but it can bring it up to uh, the machine level or what we call assembler code that uh, people, which is a pretty tricky code to read, uh, but there are people who do that to reverse engineer a lot of stuff. It's illegal to do that for uh, proprietary code. But you know, other things like the GNU, pub, the GNU public license, which you see a lot of Linux stuff written in, uh, when you receive the, the actual binary file, you also receive the original programming code. Uh, and uh, that's the... Uh, the freeware type stuff that uh, Linux uses. So if people were manipulating a binary file, they would probably be reverse engineering something because they don't have access to the original source code, which means it's probably proprietary, which means, you know, like Microsoft, I mean, my, nobody can stop you from doing it. It's not like somebody's looking on your computer while you're reverse engineering. But let's say you reverse engineered Microsoft Word and you went in and made enough small changes to it so you don't think it's Word. Microsoft, when that program starts showing up, and just because you change the top from blue to green doesn't, isn't gonna hack it, but they'll go in there and uh, they'll see that you've copied their code and they'll sue you hard. So uh, when people talk about manipulating binary files, it means they don't have the source code and they're probably doing something illegal I can't guarantee that. <laughs> Cheyenne J, first time here. Hi, hey. Geraldine's back. Good to see you, Geraldine. Mike, is the Windows Storage Spaces RAID something you recommend for everyday use on a laptop, for example? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it for that. Uh, I mean, storage spaces really counts on you having multiple drives, right? Uh, I've seen laptops that have multiple drives in them. Um, just saw very recently this very cool big laptop that had three M.2 drives in it. It was real performance 
you know, it's a six thousand dollar laptop. But no, I, I wouldn't see that. Uh, mainly because you don't have the drives to do it, right? I mean, to have any kind of RAID, you're going to have to have at least two drives, correct? I guess, could you use a thumb drive? I forget if Storage Spaces supports thumb drives. We, we, we got, went back and forth on this. But then, if you unplug that thumb drive, naughty things would happen. So, I would say no. So 1995 Texas Aggie, did I help out a little bit on the bin files or at least get you to the point where you can ask me your next question? Let's keep, let's keep moving on. Uh, Rafi, when I set firewall at low, the IPTV channels work. But if I put it medium, it blocks the channels. Okay. So Rafi, what I'd be doing is number one, what firewall are you talking about? Are you talking the Windows built-in firewall? Are you, you've got something else out there? Do you have a firewall on your router? that has some kind of low, medium, high settings. I think you are talking about the built-in one uh, in Windows, because that low, medium, high rings a bell. Mm -mm -mm. I'm pulling up Windows Defender Firewall. Mm -mm -mm. I'm just looking at my... Def Windows Defender Firewall Settings. And here in my Windows 10, I just have on or off settings. I've seen those settings low, medium, high someplace. I don't remember where they're at. Uh, okay, well, Rafi, it doesn't matter. The bottom line is, is that uh, you would need to look and see what's the difference between this low and medium, right? And research that. If you're just talking about Windows, there's tons of research on it. Uh, if you're talking about some proprietary thing, research it and see what is the difference between low and medium. What's blocked, what's not being blocked. And from there, uh, you can make some choices. Maybe low is all you need. Um, how's that for half an answer? Free thinking mind. Hello, free thinking mind. When creating a disaster recovery plan, what are the major roles and positions that must be included? Well, uh, hmm. Interesting. Well, first of all, there, I mean, there's no, it depends on, uh, you know, whose template you're looking at, but uh, it, there is no fix, there is no rule across the board that everybody must have. But, you know, I'd probably uh, disaster recovery board as opposed to, a, you know, the team. I mean, you're going to have to, you know, the executives, the big cheeses are going to be a part of it. Uh, you're you're going to have some kind of person who's the head go-to person, like a, a crisis management coordinator, or, you know, chief crisis management officer or something like that. Uh, you're, you're going to have some kind of go team. It's going to be a group of people uh, that, you know, who will be woken up at two in the morning whenever something goes bad. Uh, there's, you know, part of that is going to be the team that, you know, knows how to deal with whatever it is, because hopefully you've got, already got a plan in place. That's why you're going through all this. Uh, here, Scott's giving me some information. Uh, business continuity expert. Impact Assessment and Recovery Team. Ah, look at these. I named almost all these anyway. IT Applications Monitor and uh, Critical Business Unit Advisors. Uh, but again, uh, and uh, Dave Rush agrees, it's, it's very flexible. There, there is no fixed group of people in there that everybody's going to agree on. You know, you look at these things, you look at, say, NIST rules versus ISO rules versus ISACA rules, and they're all different. I mean, but they all basically the same thing. Is executive management, it's going to be one head honcho who's going to be in there. There's going to be some kind of go team. And then uh, IT applications monitor. Sure, I'd go with that. And a business continuity expert. I'm just reading. Scott Jernigan was kind enough to put some up for me. Yeah, so hopefully it gives you half an answer. 
Brian Jenkins, this might be too broad a question, but can you please explain ports and port numbers? Brian, I can, but I already did. Uh, we have a great video on this. We keep all these videos, Brian, and uh, we're going to, oh boy, we were just talking about this. Yeah, I started this AMA thing just to help everybody out. You know, it was not like some big thing. And anyway, we've got a pretty good pile of uh, videos now. And they're all sitting here on this Total Seminars channel. You can go through them. The problem is, is we don't have them really well sorted out. Uh, I'll tell you what. Let me get my to-do list out. Man, I'm running out of envelopes. Here we go. So Brian Jenkins, what, uh, first of all, if we need to, I am more than glad to talk about ports and port numbers again. But what I'd like to do first is find that particular video, and then that way you can watch it on your own. And we had a nice PowerPoint presentation with it. I think you did a real good job, and uh, I'd like you to watch that. And then you can ask me questions on top of that. Uh, but I'll tell you what, Brian Jenkins, this is for you, brother. I need you to send me an email so I make sure. So, Brian, and if you have a different, if you're, this is just a gnome de plume, just say, hi, Mike, this is Biff. I'm called Brian Jenkins on, on uh, YouTube. Which video has the port numbers in it? And I send me an email, and I'll dig it up, and we will find it for you. Man, I hope I just didn't volunteer myself for a tremendous amount of work. I'm starting to think, man, if I, worst comes to worst, maybe I could just do it again. But I don't want to do that again. But I am. I, uh, it's very good. I'm going to, uh, it's a great one. You sh it's, it's critical, absolutely critical that you have a good handle on uh, ports and port numbers and all that. I'll give you a little clue, though, get you started. Uh, IP addresses get the data to the right computer. Port numbers get the data to the right application, okay? So we'll get you started with that, uh, but we will definitely do it. Ian Tiemann. Hello, Ian Tiemann. I know you. I know your dad. I was uh, just uh, last weekend floating a river with Ian Tiemann's dad, so it's good to see you, Ian. I can't believe you're 17 now. You're getting old, dude. Yeah, 1995 Texas Aggie. I have never edited a binary file. Never once. I mean, maybe I went into a Word document. Because remember, a Word document is also a binary file. It just doesn't say BIN. It says DOC or DOCX on the end. And that's because it's designed to be read by a particular application. But it's still a binary file, right? The vast majority of files that are on your computer are binary files. Not all. Sorry, Barnick. I just, you know, sometimes our deals get better. I, I, I actually don't control this. Uh, this is uh, some marketing stuff. And I tell my marketing people to give pe people deals. So, sorry. All your laptops have multiple drives? Cool. You have, you have two SSDs and an NVMe. I mean, storage spaces, Java would work fine in there. You want to stripe my thumb drives for maximum speed. <laughs> uh, Andrew, you're hilarious. That's funny. Very cool. I mean, I think I have seen laptops with multiple drives, not a lot. Israel, question. I graduated from college on computer science. I don't have any certification yet. I was thinking about my A+. What are my benefits of getting CompTIA certifications? Okay, sure. It's a good question. So, Israel, uh, the entire IT world is built on the concept of certifications. Um, there are over 750 different IT certifications on, in, on Earth. And uh, certifications started in the late 1980s by a company called Novell. And they've be, just become a way for people to show their skill sets. It's, without certifications, 
short of a technical interview, there's no way that a potential employee, employer, uh, customer, whatever, has any idea of what you can do, right? Does that make sense? So certification has been around for a long time. Certifications start with the certifications I teach. So for most people, most who will want to get into IT, they usually start with A+, plus, Net+, plus, Security+. Plus. There's no law that says you have to. You can do anything you want. So it's, uh, but what it, the, the only thing a certification does is it's something you can put on your resume that puts your resume towards the top of the stack. That's all it does. Uh, I always get very nervous when people are like, oh, well, I'm going to go get all these certifications and then get a job. That's not what certifications are for. Certifications are what we use in the industry to get some sense of where your skill set and where your motivation is. Um, so, from an entry level standpoint, most entry level jobs, certainly here in the US, uh, there is a lot of push for the CompTIA A certification. Now, you're telling me you graduated from college with on a computer science degree. Now, that means you are studied programming, is my understanding. Israel, if that's not correct, please type something in and correct me. Um, but um, if, you were, if you're pursuing programming, then you would probably want to look at more uh, programming type certifications, stuff like that. So, you know, my question to you, Israel, is what do you want to do? I mean, you, you took four years to get a computer science degree. Surely in that time frame, you were thinking about what, what aspect of IT was interesting to you. Are, are you a gamer? Do you like building systems? Are you like playing with networks? I mean, you know, give me a clue and uh, I can help you out. Uh, also, I was certainly here in the United States, anybody at, from an accredited college with a four-year computer science degree can get a job rather easily, I might add. Um, so for a lot of us who, you know, if, if you're not going for a four-year degree, then you often use certifications as, as an alternate way to do things. So my quick thought to you, Israel, is you probably, well, text me and tell me what you want to do. That, that might be a big help. And I think I can develop that more a little bit. Network Mage, I often see duplicate MAC addresses in the ARP table on my local LAN. Okay, there's no such thing as an ARP table on a local LAN, right? Network Mage, uh, uh, ARP tables are, are coast specific, but only if I was running multiple adapters and virtual box. Okay, I'm not gonna disagree with that. Gin Pops, how many uh, PBQs should I expect on my upcoming 1001 exam? PBQ stands for performance-based questions, folks. Uh, Jen, uh, for 1,001, uh, two, three, or four is usually pretty much what everybody gets. I think the most I ever heard anybody get was seven. Andy, STL. Mike, can you go over asymmetric and symmetric encryption? When to use public-private keys for 501 Security Plus? Woo! Uh, sure. Uh, but up, uh, Andy, I'm writing that one down. I may want to hold that one for Friday. Yeah, uh, a lot of the U.S. is taking Friday off uh, for July 4th, Independence Day here in the U.S., uh, I'm not. I'm just, you know. We will be on this Friday. I'll be here. I don't know if any of my Total Seminars gang is going to be here, but I'll be here. Uh, Andy, uh, we'll do symmetric and asymmetric, or I'll find... We had another video on that one, but I think it's buried. Um, yeah. I think we could do something that might be kind of fun. We kind of hit on it on one video, but I don't think we really did a big one on it. Uh, we will do symmetric versus asymmetric encryption. And then what else did you ask? When to use private public keys for 501 Security Plus. 
Okay. Well, I mean, I could answer that first, that last part pretty easy. Uh, you don't really have a choice when public and private keys are used in general. Uh, so public and private keys in, in the computer world almost always manifest as certificates. So anytime you use a certificate, you're actually using public private keys, but you're, you're getting somebody's public key and they're keeping the private key. So anytime there's a certificate being used, it's probably going to be the best example of when you're going to be using asymmetric encryption. Uh, for example, anytime you go to a secure web page and the moment you see that little lock on your browser, you're using asymmetric encryption. Well, you used, at least you're using asymmetric encryption to get it started and then you use symmetric encryption to actually do all the encrypting. Mm -hmm. But we'll, we, we'll, 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 we'll uh, do it. Oh my goodness. Somebody actually dug LCK. The ports tutorial was done on Mike's AMA from April 3rd. LCK, how do you know that? Wow. LCK, dude or dudette, you're amazing. So there you go. Please watch that. Uh, who, I forgot who asked the question already. It's all right. Uh, ask, watch that video. It's a good one. I'm pretty proud of it, you know, and watch that video and then come back with more questions. All right. You can even come back and ask questions like, I totally don't get it. Try again. When, and any of these things are fun. Wow. LCK, look at you. Silas, hi, Mike, how's it going today? It's going good. Yazoo, hello, Mr. Mike, hello, Yazoo. Am I, I, I hope I'm pronouncing your guys' names right. Oh, yes, Silas, now I've settled some personal things. Do you have any study tips? Well, I think the most important study tip if you fail a CompTIA exam is don't freak out. That, that's always the most challenging thing. Um, Remember that even Mike Myers fails at least a third of all of his certification e exams, usually because I'm too cocky and I think I know everything and then I get slapped around. Um, but the only thing I would recommend it would, brought, would be get another source of practice questions. It's, let's just say you're using my practice questions and you failed, okay? It's, it's not that my practice questions are bad, it's just that you need a breath of fresh air. Uh, a lot of times, you'll just sit there and go, well, I'll just keep studying what I studied already, and, and you'll, you'll, you'll be in a hole as you're just grinding, yeah, I know the answer, yeah, I know, I know all this, plomp, you know, go to this, I know all this stuff. But if you get another set of practice questions, uh, what that does for you is it just gives you a new way to look at things. And it's fun because, you know, you'll find a practice question, you go, well, Mike Myers didn't say that. <laughs> Reprehensible. And I'll get that, and you'll send me that email. You, you did this and there. Look at this guy says this, 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 you know. And you'll have fun stuff to talk with me about. But that'd be the only real thing, you know. Get back on the horse. Sorry it happened. You're in good company. Get some new practice questions and you'll be fine. And get back in here and tell me you passed. Mm. Was Spewy the cat around again? Next phase two. Hello, Mr. Myers. Do you see software defined networking is becoming the norm? Yes. Uh, SDN is. Uh, it's already the norm. Almost any cloud-based function today, uh, SDN is the way to go. Uh, it doesn't really change that much, really. You know, what when you hear Mike Myers say SDN will become the norm, so you're like, well, I don't want to remember all this basic stuff. Yeah, you do. It doesn't change IP addressing. It doesn't change forwarding and filtering and switches and routers. It doesn't change any of that. It just changes where it's done. You know, you're, instead of having a bunch of, you know, fixed old school boxes, you end up having sort of a passive plane with devices, which are almost always cloud-based now anyway, to move out. But all the rules work the same. Routing will always be routing. Firewalls will always be firewalls. Sw layer 2 switching will always be layer 2 switching. A VLAN will always be a VLAN. 
learn that basic core stuff. And then when you move to SDN, you'll be like, ah, all they did is they kind of changed where I'm doing this. And I got, you know, instead of going into a box and pressing something in the back, I'm looking at a web interface or something, you know, it doesn't change anything. It saves you money. Uh, Okay, so Israel, you, you've done programming and you're planning to go into cybersecurity. Israel, in all probability, unless you really want to get into core hardware stuff, I don't think you need A+. You probably ought to consider Network+, plus, and you certainly ought to consider Security+. Plus. But, you know, A+, plus is really designed for, you know, blue-collar screwdriver techs like me who are working on systems, you know, breaking things in, and, you know, installing video cards, adding RAM, rebuilding operating systems, stuff like that. I'm not saying you wouldn't benefit from it. You, I'm sure you would. But, you know, especially if you've got a bachelor's degree, you need to be working immediately, like immediately. You know, just get some programmer's job or something. Get some income coming in. And, uh, you know, then start looking around, you know, most certifications are done on nights and weekends, unless you've got the money to go to some big fancy school. For most of us, we're working. You got a job already. Do not sit here and say, I need certain certifications and then I'll get a job because you'll see angry might come out and you don't like me when I'm angry. Go work. I don't care what kind of work it is. Just get a job. And you probably ought to look at Net Plus and Security Plus. Yeah, I celebrated with some good wine last night. I'm still feeling it today. Man, my workout was brutal. So what I actually discovered is I work out better with a little bit of a hangover. How crazy is that? I had a brutal workout today, man. LCK, you... you LCK, you're a dudette? Okay. Uh, LCK, so you're, you've been taking notes of my videos? Really? LCK, we might have a business transaction. LC, LCK, do me a favor. Send me an email. I want to talk. Me and the guys have already been talking about we probably need to go back in the videos and do a better job of documenting what's on each episode. And uh, it sounds like maybe you've been doing this already, so let's talk. Ankit, sir, how do I get TCP packet while email transfer? How do you get a TCP packet while email transfer? Well, your email, uh, let, let's just think for a minute. Let's say you're doing old school email where you have a client on your computer like Outlook or something like that, okay? Um, so if you're using uh, like IMAP and these packets are coming back and forth, SMTP and IMAP, you could use something like Wireshark, for example, on your local machine and you could just intercept the conversation going back and forth between your mail servers and your uh, Outlook or Thunderbird or whatever your email client is. And assuming that it's not encrypted, and sadly a lot of email is still not encrypted, uh, you could see all of the TCP packets because there would be many, many thousands of TCP packets uh, that you could look at. And uh, Wireshark is a powerful tool. It's free and you can do some very cool things with it. Uh, you need to take a look at Wireshark. Now, if you're, if you, if you're using like Gmail or something like that, um, then you'd be, that would be much more difficult because Gmail is going to be uh, encrypted HTTP. So even if you're looking at the mail on your web browser, to be able to intercept the TCP packets they're using Wireshark would, it's actually not impossible. Wireshark can read uh, encrypted anything, but you have to give Wireshark your certificate, which is actually kind of a cool thing to do. If you've never done it, you should try it. Uh, and I mean, it's the same certificate your web browser is using, right? 
And so you can give Wireshark permission to your certificate and then it will, uh, it will uh, un undo it. But even then, all you're going to get is a web page, right? You're actually not seeing the mail. So you would put all these unencrypted TCP packets together, but you would just have a web page. So I don't know if that would do it. So I, I hope that answers your question. Two forty-five. We got some time. Rafi, Mike, what is the best storage type to store pictures and videos for a long period of time as a backup and only run it to add pictures and videos? Scott Jernigan is going to hate what I'm about to say. I still use optical media like crazy for long-term storage, and. Uh, Get yourself a nice little Blu-ray, and uh, you can burn onto that. Uh, the other way is thumb drives. But then to me, the, the other thing is, this is why cloud storage was invented, is for stuff like this. For example, uh, Rafi, I, all, all photographs and videos that are precious to me, I use a website called SmugMug. Here, let me show it to you. So this is Smug Mug. Uh, it cost me about $90 a year, and it is worth every penny. It is super secure. Uh, but what makes it particularly nice is that uh, it organizes all my stuff so that I can see it very, very easily. So it does a good job. Uh, whoops. So uh, that's what I would recommend is something like that. Now, um, you know, keeping stuff long term locally like that, optical media is a good way to go. Uh, I don't have any good feel of how long does a thumb drive last, you know? Uh, uh, also, uh, external hard drives. Just a good old external hard drive like this can often be a good way to store things, but yeah, if you're looking for me to say something like tape backups or something like that, that's uh, nobody's, nobody really does that anymore, at least not on an individual basis. Michael Blakely. First time I studied Security Plus, it was a class course and another well-known video self-study course. This time it was Total Seminars of Self-Study. Both were right for my learning style each time. Cool. Well done. Pike, that's right. I, Silas, I'm never going to remember that. And I'm sorry, dude. I actually got practice exams someone else. They provided two, and I was, I'll do your other two exam. Maybe I'll get more information. Done. Yeah, there you go. Good man. USA Health Reform. Do you like Network Plus better than CCNA for those interested in cyber careers? If you really want to get, if you have... <clears throat> I'm going to think about this one for a minute. Almost anybody who does any form of security has at least a good inkling understanding of Cisco IOS and how it works. Uh, the Network Plus is an excellent certification, but as I often say, the Network Plus is the most important certification you'll never need. Uh, I don't feel Network Plus gets a lot of recognition out there. The reason I love Network Plus is because I feel CompTIA did an amazing job in letting you look at networking from a vendor neutral standpoint. If you, when you, uh, when you go into Cisco, CCNA, CCNP, all that route, they're going to turn you into a Cisco head, which is fine. You know, you work on Cisco equipment, be a Cisco head. But, my challenge to that is that uh, I think you're going to find your life a lot better off if the first time you learn about DNS is from Network Plus and not from CCNA kind of a thing. Uh, the first time you want to learn about DHCP uh, should be from Net Plus and not from learning Microsoft Active Directory integrated DHCP servers. You know, they always, all these vendors put their own spin on things. <clears throat> so, um, 
you probably need both, is, would be my quick guess. But again, so uh, U.S. health insurance reform. Are, yeah, are you working? You know, you know me. Get a job, first and foremost. Okay. My scroller is working terribly again here. Sorry, guys. Michael Blakely. How does the CYSA exam compare to the technical ability required for Security Plus? It is much harder. It's, it's, it's hard. I'm, just, I'm not going to lie. Uh, C, uh, CYSA is a challenging examination. I had to take it twice before I passed it. Tolowit, my new Ubiquiti router has a default gateway of 192.168.158.1. One. Okay. Do they do that to make it tough for malicious actors to begin causing trouble? Because the suit. Oh, okay. I see what you're asking. Uh, no, they're not. The problem is, is so many devices out there, and there is, a further, okay, first of all, a Soho router has a 192.168.1.1. That's not true. Uh, well, for example, your Ubiquity just showed you. But uh, a lot of the default uh, home routers will default like 192.168.0, uh, 192.168.8. So uh, you, can't, you can't say that Soho routers all have a 192.168.1.1 uh, LAN connection. See, when you say the router has a default gateway, remember, your router is hooked upstream to your ISP's router. So that router has a default gateway that it goes up to. Got it? So when you, you got to be careful. So when you say, my router has a default gateway, you're saying, no, it isn't. Your, your router's LAN connection, what's going to all your other computers and your wireless network, that's where the 192.168.1 is. But no. And, and uh, even if you did, uh, I never keep that. It's very, it's, you can go into any home router and change it. I, I'll use like a 172 something address just because I like something different. And also because, you know, theoretically bad guys can punch through a NAT router, but there's so many other ways to get to you. I think that Ubiquity would do it mainly to let you know they're Ubiquity and, you know, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Dave Rush, it was secure. And kid, it's 1.30 in the morning in India. Man, I get you guys from India and I'm always impressed. Thank you so much for coming. I 1.30 in the morning. Now, do keep in mind, we also record these, and they're also sitting here, so uh, when you're, uh, if, if you want to, you can also watch them uh, at your leisure as well. Twisted Soul. Uh, how much do you understand about virtual reality? Not much. I mean, we have some VR systems at Total Seminars. I'm fairly comfortable with them on a user level, but the other problem with VR is the technology keeps changing so fast. Uh, the VR system we bought two years ago, which we thought was cutting edge, and now it's two generations behind. So if you ask me, I have a good functioning user understanding of VR on two year, it's probably been out for years, so three year old technology. Uh, but feel free to ask a question. If, if I don't have an answer for you, we'll, we'll get you, we'll, we, we'll, we'll get you. Sven, hey Mike, I remember the other day you said, fake it till you make it. So I got a job applying and telling them I knew SQL. I got the job, put in two weeks, now learning SQL. Okay, Sven, I also said, don't lie. Uh, but um, first of all, round of applause, you got a job. Uh, SQL is uh, not that hard of a language, honestly. It's like learning chess. The basics are pretty easy, but it takes a lifetime to completely master it. Uh, congratulations, and uh, you know, let me know in the first time you do a, oh God, your default join statement or whatever. 
I, I used to play with sequels some. But congratulations. So Michael, you're, you're thinking that CCNA, the uh, RNS and Security Plus can really complement each other for content? Sure, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't argue that point. Greg Davis, what certs do you currently have? None, I don't know. A lot, of, a lot of CompTIA certs. I really don't keep track, I forget. Gringo Espana. That's such a funny name. I start a new job doing on prim wiring for AWS in January. I used to be a phone and data guy back in the day. It's been 13 years. Any advice to kick off the dust? Gringo, the only thing I would tell you is you're probably going to be coming in as one of the older guys and uh, be cool and avoid terms like, well, back in my day, okay, you know, just say it's cool and just, you know, match yourself to the younger set. That would tell you about the only thing. Oh, I skipped a question. I passed my, this is from Michael Blakely. I, I passed my Security Plus research two weeks ago thanks to your course. How do you develop your awesome training style? I don't know. Uh, I've got, I've got a big mouth. Um, well, I mean, I can certainly say this. I don't make anything. I, I, I think about what was it like when I was learning this stuff and what did I want to know? And I always get nervous. Like, this is like, I'm going to pick on Cisco for a minute because Cisco has a lot of in-house books that are, they're very, you know, thorough, but they're written by, you know, CCIEs and people like that who I think that they forget what it's like at the beginning. And uh, I think it makes their books almost unreadable. Uh, the other thing is that I try very hard to write a technical book or shoot videos with a narrative to it. I try to start you at this point, you know, define terms, show an example of this being used, and then go ta-da. And I also feel that a lot of technical training people fail to do that. Uh, I like to put humor into stuff. I'm, I'm a big jokester, and uh, so you're always going to see me. You know, my books are full of Easter eggs. My videos are full of Easter eggs, and I just think it's funny, and I put on funny hats, and he's they call it edutainment. Uh, so does, how did I develop the style? Uh, I don't know. I was always the little kid, so I had to either make the big guys laugh or get beat up. <laughs> I don't know. Can you help me in my projects? I am an MS in information security. Uh, and Kit, uh, so first of all, I can't really take on mentorship or things like that. I try to respond to emails. I get over 400 emails a day. And uh, the secret is, is, you know, I mean, you can keep uh, yelling at me. And I, I, I can try to help. But, you know, the big thing is uh, I can't, uh, I, I, some, I hear quest, requests like that. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, I want you to be my mentor and talk to me on the phone for an hour every day. Uh, I, I just, I don't have the bandwidth, I apologize. Okay, so things like they're quieting down here in the first hour. So there's two things we're to talk about today. Number one, I want to talk about quadruple A in particular. Uh, I want to talk about radius versus tachys. And uh, then I want to talk about some resumes. And I actually have some resume stuff. So. Let's do resumes first, because that's kind of interesting. Now, keep in mind, guys, I do not claim to be an expert at resume writing. Uh, I have hired many, many, many people over the decades. I do have a sense of what I would look for in a resume. So I actually went online and dug up some of what I thought were good-looking resumes 
that caught my eye and as a person who hires people. Uh, I also did a little research, double checking, you know, you know, how to write a resume and stuff like that. And it didn't really tell me anything I didn't know. So, uh, and then uh, we have a volunteer, somebody who's on right now actually submitted me a resume and uh, I thought we would kind of critique it together. So let's go ahead and start talking about resumes. Now, a couple of things on a resume before we get into anything else is that a resume needs to be one page. Uh, I mean, if maybe if you were going for some management level position where more information would be necessary, I don't, uh, I wouldn't, if, if you make it more than a page, you probably have messed up in my opinion. Uh, if somebody handed me a two page and one was like a cover letter, I mean, I, it wouldn't kill me. I wouldn't throw it out, but you know, I'd be messing with the staple. Um, so you, you want to make it as a single page anyway. So let's take a look at, this is just one I found that I kind of liked, All right? This is not scientific. Uh, here, well, I guess we can do it this way. Now, I know it's going to be a little small for you guys to read. It's not important that you actually read the text here. Just I want to give you an idea of what I look for. So one of the things I like is, you know, I don't mind people wasting a little space at the very top. I, I loathe when you look at a resume that is completely filled with the same level of font everywhere. So I like to see somebody's name up at the top and usually their contact information can be up there as well. On this one, they kind of put it on the side, which I liked. I think this is kind of cool. Uh, there needs to be some kind of overview statement, a summary statement, uh, anything. They, they use the word profile here. Uh, and, and this to me is probably the most important spot on a resume. Uh, and this is actually gonna go contrary to some of the stuff I read. When I do a resume, the biggest thing I want is I want to see what do they think they're applying for. Uh, so I need a fairly detailed thing here. So like what, what, like what some people will do uh, is, and I see this done a lot, is they make six different resumes. And really the only part that changes is the, the summary statement. Because you know some of these are going to sales slots, especially when you're entry level and you're not sure where you want to go. <clears throat> These are going to go to sales slots. This is a bench tech. You know, this is uh, uh, driving in a van kind of a job, something like that. And, and you kind of make different ones with different uh, profiles in them. Uh, I, I'm ne I get nervous when somebody has a profile with some really generic thing. I want to fix, com uh, even that would be okay. You know, I want to get into computers. That would bother me a little bit because I, I don't, I'm not sure that they know what they want. Okay, let's keep looking at this one. I keep doing that. All right. Next thing you know is, is going to be history. Uh, for me, I don't want to see 25 years of history on here, okay? Um, I think somebody once said that 10 years of history is enough. For me, unless there's some really super appropriate job uh, I don't really want more than your last two or three jobs. Uh, especially if it's an entry level position, you're going to be typing in, you worked at a burger joint, you worked a, you know, as a truck driver, things that really aren't appropriate. The other thing that doesn't bother me that would bother other people is I don't worry about gaps in employment. I don't even ask about it uh, because especially if you're entry level, I'm expecting that you've probably been busting yourself, trying, see Scott, I didn't say a naughty word, uh, to get a job and things have been happening. So I don't really panic about that very much. Um, I would panic more about really short-term positions. You only worked here for three months. Uh, then I'd want to see other jobs where you were there for a while. Um, but even on that, I wouldn't panic. On an entry-level slot, because I assume a high turnover. Uh, I, I wouldn't worry about that so much either. But the important thing on unemployment history is I, I want to know what did you do? First of all, what did you do? What, or what was your title? All right. And then, then tell me where you worked. All right. And then give me a light breakdown. On this example, to me, uh, 
so just one example is this big, and that seems to me to be a little big. Um, but, you know, again, I, I'm thinking in terms of IT things. Now, this is interesting, and I've seen these before, and it's basically a listing of skills. Uh, you could put certifications here and, or whatever you want, and this person uses a, like a, a, a bar graph. Uh, that might be a little cheesy, but I do like that they're showing me up front what they're looking for. Now, keep in mind, I don't worry about a lot of things like where they say problem solving, verbal and written communication. You know, here I'd be more interested, more in terms of, because it's IT, right? You know, system building, router configuration, you know, that kind of thing would be over here. All right, so that's one example. Let me, let me pull up another one. I like this one quite a bit too. Uh, we got any questions yet? Okay, I was just making sure we didn't have any questions coming up. All right, so uh, on this one, uh, somebody spent a little money on it because, you know, the two color. Uh, I got to admit, I mean, maybe putting a little color in here isn't the worst thing. Notice it's done very simply, though. Uh, here's the summary statement on this one. And then uh, so some job experience, skills, using the same notation, and then uh, education. This is where you'd put your certification stuff. Uh, this is not terrible. I, I, it might be a little cheesy, but you know, I'm used to seeing people out there who you know hire professional resume makers and stuff, and uh, there's a reason they do it, you know, because it, it, it looks good. So I like that one. All right, I got one more sample I want to show you, and then we'll. Uh, Oh, the, the last one. So this is interesting. They're actually using janitorial in this particular example. Uh, up here, I still would like to see their name. Um, I'm not sure how that would go out too well. Uh, under their objective, here they say a janitor with 10 years of experience. I, 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 I'll figure out what your experience is. Uh, I want to see what you're going for. He finally says that aiming to leverage my proven management abilities to fill managerial role at your university. And then it's stuff like bilingual thing, which are great things, don't get me wrong, really important. But again, you know, to me that would be under skills. I think that this person wasted a lot of time doing it this particular way. Again, I think the, exper the uh, experience was a little big. Uh, you know, it, it's not terrible though. Uh, but in here, there's certainly things I'm looking for, you know, if this is a m management job, here they're managing, here they're training, all right? Uh, now they had remove all finger marks and smudges from vertical surfaces. I, I don't, you know, this might be a little bit of a joke, of course, but, uh, you know, to me, I'm looking for certain words that tie into the job that I'm looking for. All right. So these are three example resumes. I looked at probably 30 that I just kind of liked. And uh, so what I want to do now is uh, somebody has been kind enough, who is actually on the chat today, to email me a resume. And I thought we could kind of go over it together. And let's see if we can punch it up a little bit. You guys ready? All right. All names have been erased to protect the innocent. Okay, so first of all, a uh, little boring. I'd like to see more heading information. They did put all their personal information in here, but this would be the place to make it a little bit bigger. Uh, that, I wouldn't find that uh, offensive at all. And it would make it easier for me to zero in on somebody. Uh, the fact that it's single color, it's fine. You don't need to have color. I'm just saying, you know, if, you go, if people are going through a stack of resumes, what can you do to make it stand out? It might be too expensive. Okay, here in the summation, uh, college graduate, I would have figured that out. Um, w working at a synagogue, currently working, I would have figured that out by looking at that. Uh, I would rather see more skills listed because uh, they're using the summary here as a description of their skills. Um, I would, I'd like to see that done 
separately. You could just, you don't have to do the split in two resume like we were looking at earlier, but I'd like to see more information on that. Uh, what else? I am seeking to begin a career in IT. I'd really, you know, if there would be a way, you know, say sales for the sales folks, you know, that kind of a thing, you know, print them as you go. I mean, it, 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 if you need a generic statement like that, then do it, but, you know. I like the way the work experience is much shorter, just boom, 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 you know, and I see words that are interesting to me, manage, you know, configuration, operation, online presence. Uh, I would like to see, you know, if, if, like if this is a web kind of a thing, I'd want to see more information than saying just online presence. Um, provide online troubleshooting, yeah, there we go. Hardware and software troubleshooting, that's great. So it looks pretty good, it's got the certification at the bottom, got your A plus there, that's good. You gotta be careful about certifications, uh, especially if you start getting a number of them. You'll, you'll discover that people sh try to wear them like medals, and you don't wanna do that. The certification is something like, ah, you know, I got a little cert here. You know, you don't talk about, it. you don't have to bring your A plus certificate to your job. <laughs> Please don't do that. People know what the A plus is, and they'll, they'll either recognize it and be happy or not. And uh, the person who did this did it just right. Just plopped it down there at the bottom. You know, it's in there. Um, you wouldn't necessarily have to date it. I think, in fact, there's only one cert that this person wanted to put in June of 2020. Uh, but I, I don't think that would be necessarily critical. Uh, so, anyway, uh, I hope that helped out a little bit. Um, and again, I'm not a resume expert, folks, okay? I'm only just telling you as a guy who's hired people, some of the stuff I'd be looking for that would uh, help out. The most important thing you can do with a resume is make it and get it out there. Uh, don't use what I just said as an excuse for you to delay you getting a job for another two weeks. Just, you know, you got a copy of Microsoft Word, you got Google Documents online, make yourself a resume and get it out there. That's, that's the most important. <laughs> Morning Saint, wouldn't a full bar portend the applicant knows there? Nah, not necessarily. Morning Saint, nobody knows everything and anything in IT. It would give me an idea of your comfort level with it. BVP boy doesn't like the graphs. Like I said, it, you know, it's a... It's something I stumbled into. Uh, and if I were looking at that thing, I would just assume that everybody's rating themselves too high. But again, it gives me an idea. Uh, it gives me an idea of uh, their confidence level, certainly. Yeah, I'm not against it. Yeah, Dr. The, the cat. Where's the cat now? Kitty. The cat follows me around like constantly and now, oh, here, here it comes. Here, Whistle's gonna bring over the cat just so I can prove to you I've not killed the thing. That is so weird looking in the can. All right, meow. Yes, he's already, let me down, let me down. I'm done. Go fix the International Space Station, Wissa. <laughs> it's a tough day on the uh, NASA front for the space station. That's the first time she's got off that desk all day. Um, So Marty, you're saying it's tough to get into IT because everybody's moving to the cloud. Well, then move to the cloud with them. I, I know lots, you know, those cloud companies, uh, Amazon has, hires thousands of techs 
annually, thousands, just in the United States. And uh, Google hires thousands of, of the stupid phone did it again. Uh, Google hires, uh, what I found. shut up, G word uh, does it. So just go to the cloud with them. There's still plenty of people out there twisting screwdrivers and replacing hard drives and doing all that kind of work. It's just that a lot of times, instead of you know the 10,000 mom and pops like we had 15 years ago, well, in Houston, we still got a lot of mom and pops, but you know sometimes you gotta go to where the job is. But you know, there's more people twisting screwdrivers today than there's ever been before. It's just that they do it in big air-conditioned buildings that don't have any windows. Go Zips 30. I've been told by hiring professionals and staffing agencies that at my age, I am likely too old for the industry and that extra education might also make me unemployable. Really? Go Zips 30? Who told you that? Yeah, I agree, Marty Willie. Go Zips 30. Are you in the United States and someone told you that? I, I don't know about overseas, but the huge number of techs are in their 40s and 50s. Corporate retrainers. The biggest problem, I, I, sorry, you guys have heard this speech before. For a lot of people, they're like, you know, they're, they're, they're a career changer. And I'm, I'm going to pick on you, Go Zips 30, for a minute. So... You're 38 years old. All right, you've been doing something else for the previous 20 years, okay? And whatever that thing you were doing before uses computers. I don't care what it is, you know? Uh, told what, you're, you were a cook? Then there's a billion restaurant companies out there. Uh, they're, you know, printing companies that just go around and update menus for people. And it's just, there's a million things where you take the skills you have and then you get into IT with that. And that's usually a very easy jump for a lot of people. Well, yeah, I'm not going to get in the whole uh, discrimination thing. But, uh, yeah, 38 is like a kid. I'm almost 20 years older than you. Uh, so yeah, I see there's a lot of career changers out there. That, that's what you do. <laughs> okay. Matt Orton, why am I obsessed with upgrading my PC with no real reason to doing so? Because it's there. Matt, I understand. I do it all the time. Like all the time. I'm looking at my computer and, you know, I've added more RGB lights just because I could. <laughs> so it's okay. You know, PC being a tech, it's a drug man, you know, but uh, I understand. Oh, look at all the, see, go Zips 30. There you got Morning Saint and Aaron, all, everybody's chipping in. Unbearable suffering, <laughs> what a name. Brendan S. Sounds like a company that prefers younger people with less experience so they buy undercut them and pay another areas. Nah, these days they're pretty comfortable undercutting everybody's pay. Alice Pazzi. What Gossip said is true in Italy. Alice, I, yeah, okay, I, I will accept that phrase. I'm painfully, this came up about two weeks ago. We got a lot of you uh, Euro folk who are listening in and I am not up to speed on the employment situation in the EU slash UK, uh, and I'm working on it, but uh, I've hit some real walls. I think people are embarrassed to tell me that how bad it is over there. Uh, we'll leave it there, but thank you, Alice. That, that's good. Uh, these little bits help. Okay, and Kit, does frame length, frame number, and bytes captured during sending a mail, all the values 
are more of TCP than UDP? Yeah, Ancrit, uh, in, a, in, a, in an email, all of, the pa all of the packets are TCP. So I'm, I'm, I don't want to challenge you on your English, but I think that's what you're saying. Uh, frame length is fixed by the, uh, it's fixed at about 1,500 bytes. Frame number and bytes captured sending a mail. Ancrit, go get Wireshark. <laughs> W-I-R-E-S-H-A-R-K. You will like it. It's a lot of fun and you'll learn a lot. Yeah, go zips. I'm sorry that you hit some idiots and they are idiots and Man, give them my phone number. I'll be glad to talk to them on a personal basis. Uh, yeah, as the, as the Romans would say, nul bastardo corborundum. Don't let the bastards get you down. Just move on. Move on. Keep those resumes flying. Azad's. Hey, Azad. I didn't see you before. Dear Uncle Mike. Yeah, that's scary. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm switching career, yes. Nearly finished my diploma in IT infrastructure at college and about to do my CompTIA certs. Should I go for a job, any job in IT? Yes, as odds, you should be working now. I mean, unless you're going to school full time, you should be working now. Uh, you know, it's, it's, I know it's tough sometimes, but uh, yeah, you should, if you're going to school full time, then you don't have to work. But, you know, I, I don't know where your rent's coming from. Uh, but uh, you, you should be getting out there. So, uh, yes. You should go for any job in IT. You absolutely should go for any job. Your first two years in IT, if you'll probably have three jobs in those first two years. That's very commonly done. And you're just, you know, you bounce around a lot. Uh, HR people sometimes get a little crabby about it. After about two years, though, there's a certain point where you find jobs and stick to them. Uh, but at first, you're bopping around, grab anything you can, and just keep those resumes going. You know. WebTuber, Mike, do you prefer AWS or Azure for cloud training? I prefer AWS simply because we actually use AWS. Uh, and I, I, I was with Amazon almost from the beginning, and uh, I just know it better. And to be honest with you, I have not given Azure, I know I don't pronounce it right, Scott, bite me. Uh, I know I haven't given it a fair shake um, and I need to. So I, use, I like AWS because I know it. Uh, I think cloud platforms are something you get into one and you stick with it and never change. PVP boy, so what if someone discriminates against you? Is it bad? It's bad for their business. Yeah, so what? Yeah, it's bad for, absolutely, PVP boy. Keep it going. Yeah, go Zips 30. Just wipe those people, wipe that dirt off you and move on, man. I'm just reading, folks. You guys are lots of good, good, good camaraderie there. Good for you. Emily and Malin 2 colon P. Hello. Hello. I'm here. You want to hear Mike Myers do a bad British accent? No. That sounds like Dick Van Dyke and Mary Poppins. I don't know. Even though you have a few certs, do you leave it out from the summary and put it in the sections of a complement certification? Yeah, definitely, Geraldine. I, you, you wouldn't want to put it up there. You know, it's, it's you don't want to show cert, so yeah, you don't want to show off certifications like medals on your chest. It, you know, you just cool, just be cool. People will read them. Morning Saint. 
a coder, the hidden language of computer hardware and software. I'm going to check that out. It's actually easier for me sometimes just to take a picture of the chat screen. I'll check it out. Thanks to the inside line, man. Glenn Daddy. Mike, what is better for developing experience? A long-term FTE position or going the contract route? <laughs> Glenn, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur in my soul, so I would probably say the contract route, but you know, I'm also, I'm not risk adverse. I've always been one to kind of dive off into things. And uh, so full time when you can get it, you know, it's usually you're going to have better benefits. And, you know, the other thing that comes in, Glenn, is, you know, the, the wife and the kids and the health plans and, you know, those kinds of things. If you're in the States, we worry about health plans a lot. But contracting gigs, you know, you get in front of a lot of other people, a lot of different things. And you tend to be doing the same job, but in different places and different ways. And sometimes you got to climb up a ladder to get to it. And, you know, so I like the contract route. GoZips30, did you hear that Microsoft is shutting down all the retail stores? Yep, I sure did hear about that, which is disappointing. Uh, here in Houston, we, the Microsoft store was like right next to the Apple store. And I always enjoyed the contrast between them. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry that Microsoft is going. I mean, it was almost more like a Samsung store in a lot of ways. And I guess Samsung's been opening up their own stores, so I can see why they might do it. Mike, are the FOA certs worth a... Well, Gringo, I'm not familiar with FOA certs. Uh, I always did, uh, oh Lord, <sighs> Bixie certs for cable pullers. So the fact that I don't know about it says something right there. As odds, my previous college signed me up with some CompTIA and ethical hacking certs, said you can get a 60K plus job. Oh, sorry about that. And, you know, for me, the main reason to go to a tech school is job placement. And part of the, for me, when I'm looking at a school, I'm going to say, you know, what percentage of your students are placed in a job within six months of graduating? And, you know, the schools that do a good job are very proud of that number. And if they're not saying 90, 85 to 90 percent, uh, you know, that's something you really have to think about. So, yeah, uh, unbearable, unbearable suffering. So you're in the UK. Uh, yeah, some of the tech schools that in there. So last time I was in the UK, we kind of did a tour of southern. You know, we we kind of went south from London and came around. So, and I'm, I, I I always think I know the UK better than I actually do. And they have what are called B schools, and uh, these were, as I could tell, they were publicly funded schools that there was no uh, tuition involved and uh, you know they were placing people and uh, yeah I don't I don't remember it's, it's, it was like three years ago four years ago So Andre, you got a job, job interview for the 13th, building and refurbishing server cabinets and hardware inside. Get yourself a set of good knee pads. I've done that kind of work. I have sensitive knees. You're always kneeling down and trying to do something. Hey, gringo, we're all in Houston, man. Come on. 
Scott's in Houston, I'm in Houston, Dave's up north. Man, I'm, I'm just, it's so frustrating to hear these stories about schools like this. It's, I, I, I can only say I, my heart, uh, you know, reaches out to you guys. I, I've, I've seen this happen so many times. And, uh, you know, I guess the nice thing is B-Tech. Yeah, PVP boy, it sounds like a B-Tech. That sounds familiar. Yeah, well, uh, Total Seminars is based in Houston, gringo, so that's why you would... Because normally, when we're not sitting in our houses, we get in our car and drive to work every day, and, you know, Scott and I have lunch and have a cup of coffee with Dave Rush, and Michael Smyer makes the coffee for all of us because he gets there first, you know? It's like a regular office. It's probably covered in dust this thick. All right, so it looks like... Uh, So Gringo, you're in Spain now. You know, that's one, the two countries in Europe that I haven't been to that I really want to go to are Italy, never been to Italy, and I've never been to Spain. And you know, I get lots of folks uh, who I know who've been to Spain, they all, they think it's great. Yes, unbearable suffering, I guarantee you that there is confusion of terms. I, I am uh, a little confused there. So. College is after school, and the qualifications are required to go to university. Okay, that helps. E. White, you went to ITT Tech? Uh, I used to love ITT Tech. Uh, they worked pretty hard for placement. I mean, I worked with IT, ITT Tech here in the States, uh, helping folks get jobs. Uh, and the administrators I met, at least the ones that were physically here in Houston, Texas, were very dedicated people who worked hard and had a great place in it. I even hired ITT Tech people to work for me. Uh, I, I was very happy with those employees. College offers BTECs, which are pre-university courses, which are free if you're under 18. Yeah, I do remember Unbearable Suffering. There was a younger crowd in there. All right, well guys, it's 3.30, we only got 30 more minutes left, and I did want to talk about AAA today. Uh, we're gonna, we're, this is Radius and, and Tacus. The, the challenge we have here is that we, we can really go into a lot of detail. Uh, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper than anything you'll see on any CompTIA exam. Uh, I can go a lot deeper if you want, but um, this, this is, the main problem people have with things like radius and tachycus is where do we use it? And so that's really what I, I want to address. First of all, though, what I want to talk about is what is triple A, all right? And you can see I've worked very hard on these PowerPoints. They're pretty plain. All right, so when we talk about triple A, we're talking about authentication, authorization, and accounting. So, uh, Authentication is the process of identifying and then allowing somebody in. So, I mean, the classic form of authentication is like a username and a password. But authentication could be a PIN code, it could be a retinal scanner, it could be a smart card, uh, you know, there, there's a, a lot that goes into, it could be a certificate. Um, there's a lot of things that go into that first aspect. The second part is authorization. So authorization is, okay, now that you've been authenticated, what am I going to let you do on this system? So if you're thinking about uh, like authentication on a Windows system, where you log in in the morning, you type in a username and a password, but then it's your NTFS permissions that say what you can do. Okay, now that we know you're Michael M with password of XYZ123, we could apply NTFS permissions to files and folders to determine what you can do. 
and other people, if they log in, they would have different permissions. So that's usually the best example of the difference between authentication and authorization. So authentication gives you the key and then authorization that your key can only open certain locks. I don't know how hard we want to go into that analogy. And the last one is accounting. There's a lot of things that happen that we want to keep track of what's going on. Uh, who's logged in? How long did they log in? How many fa how they failed to log in? What were they doing when they were there? And so accounting usually manifests as log files that are put somewhere on a system so that we can look at them and go through an audit and see what's taken place. So when we talk about AAA, there are two big places where this comes into play. And the first one is going to be in wireless networks. So let's take a look at this. So the first one is going to be called RADIUS. RADIUS is Remote Authentication Dial-In User Service. RADIUS was originally designed for people to dial in and log into mainframes was like the original idea. And it's, it has changed dramatically from that. TACX, and there's a little plus sign on the end, uh, stands for Terminal Access Control Access Control System. TACX is used by exactly one person, and that is Cisco. Well, Cisco and competitors like Juniper and Ubiquity and folks like that, okay? So RADIUS, the one place where RADIUS is used, and the only place you're going to see it mentioned in a CompTIA exam is in wireless networks. So here's a classic little wireless network. I got a wireless access point there, and I got a couple of uh, computers that want to access the SSID that this wireless access point is putting out, right? So there's a little computer and a smartphone, okay? So in these situations, traditionally what we're going to be doing is using a, a private shared key, PSK. And uh, that means that when we're setting up the SSID, we go into the wireless access point and we, after we name our SSID, whatever you want to call it, and we give it a shared key, which is a phrase or something. And we've all seen this. You know, you've been to the coffee shop and, hey, what's the wireless password? That means you're using a PSK. That's simple. So that works great in small setups. However, when things start getting complicated, so here we've got, now we've got three wireless access points and we've got some big rack mounted setup here and now things are going to get, start to get kind of complicated. This is where uh, PSK begins to fail. Imagine a situation where, where we'd have to change it. So you'd have to go through and go to all the wireless access points and change it. You might have some kind of cool central switch that all the wireless access points plug into, so you could make one change there, but then you'd have to retell everybody where it is. You have no control on who's logging in or out. Uh, you know, if somebody quits, as long as they still have the PSK, they can still get in your wireless network, right? So PSK, which is what 99.99% .99 of us use, at home and in small offices in an enterprise is a real security problem. So the 802.11 standards provide another thing called a RADIUS server, okay? So let's take a look at RADIUS real quick. So in this network, what's going to happen is I'm going to installing some software and make one of my boxes a RADIUS server, okay? When you have a RADIUS server, you've got three different things. You've got the server itself, and then all your wireless access points are called authenticators, and then anybody who's logging into this is a supplicant. So you got supplicants, is anybody trying to log in? The WAPs themselves are the authenticators, and the RADIUS server does all the authentication. Now, how this RADIUS server works, there's a tremendous amount of variance in this. Uh, you can have, uh, for example, Microsoft has a built-in RADIUS server. It used to be called IAS. It's called 
Network Protection Server now. I forget what it's called, but it's built into Windows Server. Uh, you can get third-party uh, ser Radius Server softwares. The one thing all Radius servers have in common is that they're a pain in the rear end to configure. You have all of these different encryption protocols that are taking place mainly between your uh, wireless access points and the Radius server itself. So it's all very secure. Radius is surprisingly not really secure between the supplicants and the wireless access points. Uh, there is, I'm not saying it's easily cracked, but uh, it's, it's great security between the supplicants and the server is not a high point for Radius. But what it does do is it allows you to have some kind of login to the wireless network that is easily controlled and it's at a user level so we can keep track of every user when they log in. This is where the accounting comes into play, folks. And it does a pretty good job. What Radius also doesn't do a good job on is authorization. It's great at authentication because Radius can use all kinds of stuff. You can put certificates in your laptops and your phones if you wanted to and use that. You can have them use smart cards. Um, you can, I guess if you could figure out a way to put a retinal scanner on your laptop, uh, everybody's got a camera now, that might be easier than you think. Uh, then you could use that. So it's got a lot of tremendous flexibility. Almost every enterprise radius setup I've ever seen just to use a username and a password. But it goes further than that. That radius server, depending on how you've got it set up, that radius server might have its own list of usernames and passwords. It could use your Active Directory domain users as the usernames and passwords. See, you get the idea? So it has tremendous flexibility, and with tremendous flexibility comes a lot of configuration. Uh, and they are a bit of a challenge to set up. But that is your only real answer. 802.11 adopted radius. So if you want to authenticate wireless clients, you have to use Radius because 802.11 chose it 20 some odd years ago and it works and we're still using it today. That just answered a couple of uh, net plus questions for sure right there. All right. So for Radius, it's commonly used for enterprise 802.11 networks and really just about that's all it's used for. It uses UDP ports uh, 1812 and 18. That's not right. I have a typo. Ah, I cannot fix this easily. It's 1813. I got to double check that now. Oops. Just remember UD port, UDP port 1812. It's like 1812 for authentication and 1813 for logging. Anyway, it's not 1818. I'm looking on Wikipedia. It doesn't show it. I bet Scott Jernigan or somebody else has already typed it in. Eh, there we go. E. White, Aza, Cameron, thank you very, very much. 1812 and 1813. Thank you for fixing me. Yeah, Mike Myers made a mistake. Can you believe that? Uh, there are some popular Radius servers out there. Open Radius and Free Radius are two free versions. And uh, I've worked with Open Radius. It works pretty good. Uh, it is still a pain in the rear end to configure. Okay, now this is looking rather strange. Okay, so what I got here is a rack, all right? We're moving on to Tacus. So you take a look at this rack. I've got a, a couple of punch downs up at the top here, and then I've got one little switch. All right. Now, in most networks, when you only have like one switch and one router or something like that, there's usually one person with like a buddy who's backup, and they have administrative rights to these devices. Um, 
like, like you know, on Cisco boxes, they call it uh, executive privileges, and they can do whatever they want on these boxes. And that's good because they're the nerds. You want them to be able to do what they need to do. But sometimes things can get a lot more complicated. So let's just say suddenly we start adding lots of routers and lots of switches. And let's just say we've got all kinds of locations and they're all covered in routers and switches. Well, now we've got an issue because you have to have user accounts at every Cisco box, every Juniper box, every Ubiquity box has usernames and passwords. And if you want to get in there and do stuff, you have to have a username and a password. Now, I'm going to pick on Cisco. So Cisco has two kinds of logins. Like you can do a, like a basic login. I forget what it's called, terminal mode, something like that. And you can do some real basic stuff, like you can see the configuration of the system. But you can't make any changes. So you got to go into another mode by a second login called this executive mode. And imagine if we're in a situation where we've got routers and switches all over the place, we have to have the same username and password. And again, same situation. What if Bob the tech quits? Are we, we're going to have to go through every router and switch and change, you know, delete his account or whatever it might be. Um, and then more than that, it, like with Cisco boxes, there's only two levels. There's like this super basic level, and then there's like you can do anything level. But there's really a lot more levels. It's just that Cisco doesn't advertise it. But you can set these things up. You can set up a router so that, you know, People can only configure VLANs when they log in. You can set up a or you set up a switch so people can configure VLANs. You can set up a router so that uh, only certain people can configure the access control list. Get the idea? So there's actually I think it's 14 levels on Cisco iOS operating system, and it's just we rarely use those except when you get into these types of situations where you need a lot more granular control and you need triple A to be able to do this. And Cisco back in the 90s looked at Radius because Radius existed back then. Um, but Cisco's like, it's not good enough. Uh, you know, it's, uh, Radius doesn't do a real good job of encrypting point to point. Uh, Radius doesn't do a really good job of uh, authorization uh, it does a good job on authentication, doesn't do a good job on authorization. And Cisco's like, we, we, we're just going to make our own thing. And they came up with Tacus as a way to handle AAA, but for switches and routers. You're not going to deal with AAA Tacus working on computers, right? It's not where it works. And by the way, all Cisco wireless access points use Radius just fine, okay? But we're talking about actually going in, making changes to routers, make checking configurations on switches, that kind of stuff, you're going to use Tacus. Okay. <laughs> so Tacus, hello, it uses TCP port 49. It was developed by Cisco and it's used by Cisco and most most of their competitors to control device access. I think that's it. Yeah, okay. So the kind of questions you're going to run into are what are the port numbers? Where is it being used? Uh, and isn't it interesting? Radius was designed for a way for us to log into mainframes and it's moved into something totally different. Uh, but they're, they're used in very different places. I hope that answers the question. We already went deeper than any CompTIA exam will do on these, but not much deeper. Uh, oh, I do have, here, yeah, I can show you something. You might get a kick out of this. It's going to be a little hard to see, but uh, this is a uh, demonstration of a tool called Tacus GUI, and uh, it is a wonderful little piece of software that allows you to deal with your TACA stuff. So you can, you can make users. Uh, I can have user groups. 
Uh, I can add devices. Um, the Takis configuration is a little bit boring, but you know, just some basic configuration stuff. But really, here's the big thing. It's all the reports. And th this is why people do Takis. It's, it's the uh, accounting. So I can sit here and see who's been logging in and logging out, if somebody's failed, uh, authorization. What, what have they been doing? So permitted somebody to configure, a, denied somebody from uh, configuring a terminal or show running. These are uh, iOS commands if, if you're not familiar with it. And you know we can configure what these people have or can do. And I mean, that, this is really the, the, the beauty of all of this. So, make sure you understand the difference between Radius and Takakis. Yes, they're both AAA, but they serve very different masters and in pretty different ways. All right, so, do you have any questions on that? I always trips me out. So anytime I start talking about something, it's like all the questions end. Is that telling me I'm doing a good job? I hope. And Kit, you're asking questions about uh, what are the job possibilities for me? Good. You, you'll be graduating in 2021 in IS. So I'm assuming you're getting a bachelor's degree at a university uh, in information security. Does certificates I have to do along? Again, and get, got to remember, certificates do not get you jobs. Certificates put your name at the top of the stack when jobs are out there, okay? At no time should you go get certificates and then go get a job. It doesn't work that way. You start at very low level. You're picking up certs on the nights and weekends. You throw those certifications at the bottom of your resume. People see it, and then you move up, okay? and then you get another job. Uh, if you're graduating with a bachelor's degree at a university in information security, many of the certificates that I'm talking about, in particular like IT fundamentals and A+, would probably be of no interest to you. Um, you know, these are more what I call light blue collar certifications. I'd even put Network Plus in there, even put Security Plus in there to a small degree. Uh, keep in mind, Ankit, that there are hundreds of certifications, especially if you want to go into IT security. You're going to be go looking at GISA. You're going to be looking at IC squared. You're going to be looking at ISACA. Uh, you're going to be looking at EC Council. And each one of these organizations have a large number of certifications. And, that, and they pick these paths, and that's what they go with. But even at that level, it, it doesn't change anything. Certifications don't get you jobs. Certifications put your name at the top of a stack. If you are not getting a job because you think you need certifications, you're not playing this game right. Go to work, okay? Gringo, if any of your seminars guys ever come to Zaragoza, Spain. All right. Uh, Gringo, you're never going to get me in that AWS center. I've tried to get in the ones here in the States, and they are impossible. Chris Vincent just scheduled both of your exams today. Good luck, man. Y'all are just chatting to each other. Zods, Mike, is it important and desirable for a job role, for a job role, if I be certified for IT, uh, oh, uh, the driver's I forget what it is. Yeah, Azad's, you know, I mean, ITIL, there's nothing wrong with those certs, but the thing is, is that 
the certifications, I told you the certifications don't get you jobs. They only get your name at the top of the stack, which is true. But then there's also an assumption. Uh, when I'm talking to another nerd, I'm always asking them, hey, you going for any certs? You know, what are you doing? It, it's, it shows us that we're continuing to want to grow. Do me a favor and look up Mike Myers' 10 Commandments on YouTube. Mike Myers' 10 Commandments. And I talk a lot about people flatlining in our industry because in the IT world, if you're not constantly learning, you're, you're, you're a flatliner and you'll eventually get out of the industry. Um, so we use certifications as a tool set to also show our motivation to, to continue to learn. Uh, so th those are the big ones. So my answer to your question is yes. Gringo. No, oh, it's I, I don't I don't think you have to retake the A plus unless you're actually just I mean if you're working on systems. Oh stupid this scroller is just so frustrating. All right, it looks like you guys are just chatting together here. Just looking for questions. Dave L. So the difference between radius and tachus, I always say tachus, it's tachat. Tachus. Is that radius has no authorization. Radius does have authorization. I need to be careful when I say that. It doesn't have the fine granular authorization that we see with tachus. Uh, to say that is the difference would be unfair. It is a variance to it. Um, you know, I would also say the difference is, is one uses TCP and one uses UDP, right? And so, uh, but so let's not say the is one aspect of Radius that it has weaker authorization capabilities in TACUS? Yes. But you think about this, you know, on a wireless network, all we're trying to do is only allow people who are supposed to be on the wireless network get on. So Radius performs all the authorization necessary because it only needs to say whether they can get on or not. Get the idea? TACUS has a much bigger job to do. It has to, you know, we have to develop groups and then decide what they want to do. Can they just show a running config? Can they configure VLANs? You know, can they, you know, change out switch ports? You know, the, it, it needs much more granularity than radius. And that's why Cisco wrote it. And they'll tell you that. PVP boy, if you could add other commandments, what would they be? Nope, I think they're, uh, I think I got them all there, man. Brian J, been watching your videos on Udemy. Constant question how you've never knocked your mug off the table with your hand gestures. Because I've knocked that mug off a hundred times, Brian. Those, those end up on the cutting room floor. And also some of those are uh, some pretty nice cups. I, I like some of those. Oh, Dave Rush, free radius and open LDAP on a Raspberry Pi. You just created a win domain. Really? Open LDAP will emulate a win, an, an NT domain? Okay, that's cool. Okay, guys, we just got one more minute. So, Philip D. Charmoy, A plus and F plus have to be renewed every three years. I wanted to ask, what CompTIA Certmaster CE is? Um, yeah, you don't have to retake the exam. You can, just, you can take these little short courses. But Philip, you need to go over to www.comptia.org and check it out because you can end up going to conferences and those are CEs. Uh, you can take other certs and they're treated as, as automatic updates. CompTIA has a, a wonderful entire page on continuing education. And there's all kinds of options and alternatives that you can do to uh, re-up your exams. 
And also the other thing is, don't re-up your exam. I mean, come on. You know, you're, you're moving on in life and you've decided to become wireless, you know. So you'd start taking certified wireless network professional certifications. And now you're configuring WAPs and, you know, setting up switches and all this stuff. You're, no one's going to care about your A plus anymore. See where I'm coming from? So, you know, why retake it? Now, somebody like me who teaches A plus, yeah, I need to retake it every year. Uh, somebody who's, uh, you know, working on systems all the time, yeah, they should retake their A plus all the time. But most of us tend to forget about our older certs and just concentrate on the new ones. Uh, and you know, I'm sure CompTIA gets very angry when they hear me say stuff like this, but it's it's the truth. I, why recert? unless your job or your interests are pointed in that direction. Otherwise, you're moving up. You're getting higher paid jobs with more interesting things, more complicated certifications. Okay, guys, it is 4 o'clock, so we need to wrap up. Yes, keep in mind, we have the AMA specials today, 60% off our simulations and practice tests. Uh, code is MMLiveFireworks at checkout. That's www.totalsim.com. Uh, that uh, that's all we got for today guys thank you so much uh, we will be back on Friday and we'll be talking about uh, we'll, we'll have a, a conversation about symmetric and asymmetric again probably we'll see I'll put that on but I reserve the right to change my mind uh, and uh, hopefully uh, We'll have some good good stuff on top of that. I promise there'll be giveaways on Friday. We'll be giving something away. So until next Friday, this is your little Uncle Mike saying good night. Good night.